Hi, everyone. This is not going to sound unusual to you, but I had quite a common habit as a child. I used to like to challenge everything. So when my mom said to me, don't go to bed with wet hair, you're going to wake up deaf. <laughs> I thought, there's no way that's going to happen. So of course I did my nightly routine, had my bath, snuck in a little bit of a hair wash, and when she wasn't looking, I snuck down the passage. I thought, I'm just going to scream, night, night. And of course I'm eight years old, why would I be putting myself to bed? So I sneaked down the passage, night, night, and I jump into bed with wet hair. My mom had a really um, wicked sense of humor. And when I say wicked, I mean wicked. So she hatched a plan. She said, um, she said to my dad, I'm going to teach her a lesson. So the next morning, she came to wake me up for school, which is what she always did. And usually she'd like gently shake me awake and say, Megan, Megan, wake up. You know, and naturally you come out of your slumber. Uh-uh, not that morning. The next morning, she came to wake me up for school, and she went like this. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine my horror? I screamed, and all I can remember thinking was, can you actually hear yourself screaming when you're deaf? <laughs> and there's definitely a different psychology around how children are raised. I've been spending quite a lot of time recently around moms and dads and kids, and one of the things that really strikes me is that Parents will do anything to keep their children safe. And I think when it comes back to my parents, one of the things that really stands out for me is that they had two key skills. One was humor, and the other was adventure. So it comes as no real surprise when I describe to you what they looked like. It was a little bit of a strange, humorous kind of attraction between them. One, my mom was five foot four. And uh, at five foot four, you could always identify where she was. She had her handbag affixed to her arm. How many of you have that? Moms in South Africa have always got their handbags, right? So there's my mom, five foot four, with her handbag attached to her arm. And my father looked like Superman. So he was six foot eight tall. Yeah. <laughs> and you probably guess six foot eight is around two meters. So he literally used to duck through doorways. So you've got five foot four mom and six foot eight, eight dad. And we really just had this huge, big, adventurous spirit. I grew up in Zimbabwe. And when I was around three and a half years old, my dad decided it was a fantastic idea uh, that we would do the trout bike rally together. Um, and the trout bike rally is actually quite a long rally. It's a, it's a day long rally. And one of the things that you'll find uh, if you also hang around with children, um, uh, moms and dads with children, is that they like a bit of routine. Children do like to sleep. My dad wasn't going to let that happen. He was like, come on, we're going on the bike. And we got on the bike, and off we went. And he could start to feel me kind of sliding off the back a bit. And if any of you are thinking this is slightly horrific, there's nothing horrific about this story. He just pulled out a piece of rope from the back of the bike, tied it around him and me, and I went to sleep by putting my thumb in my mouth and sleeping for the rest of the, the rally. And what we won from that was an award. It was a small badge that said I was the youngest entrant to do a trout rally. I think the strange part about it was that it was in the pouring rain, tied to my father. <laughs> yeah. So it, it becomes really interesting to me because we were like Superman and Superchild. And I started to get some ideas around who I was and the things that I could do and the things that I couldn't do. And it seems to me to be like a really important phase in life when you're young. You start to learn things quite early. One of the first things that you learn is the sound of your name you know that your name is different from anyone else's. Of course, until you get older, like me, and realize there's other Megans and you're horrified. Like, what? <laughs> so, learning the sound of your name first, you also then start to distinguish yourself by whether you're a boy or a girl, whether you're tall or short or thin or fat. And these things start to mean something. And I'm always very curious around how people create identities and labels around themselves, because on the one hand, it's quite a powerful thing to say, I know who I am by what I'm not. I know the things that I like and I don't like. And I certainly differentiate myself in this particular way. But it's also extremely dangerous, as I'm sure you can imagine, when people create labels as well. We start to think there's certain things that we can do and certain things that we can't. Of course, I needed to go to varsity. Um, Bless my parents. I think uh, they were kind of like, OK, good luck to you. Just you know, go, go and do it. Go and see what happens. And I moved from my small coastal town, East London, to, 
to Cape Town. And one of the things that comes out of growing up in a small town, uh, I'm not sure if any of you have the syndrome here in Grahamstown, I call it terminal uniqueness. We're so terminally unique. And that's something that really strikes me about South Africans as well. It's like there's 50 odd million of us who are so terminally unique. I'm different to you, okay? This is my identity. So I went off to Varsity in Cape Town, and when I got there, the first thing that occurred to me was that I didn't know a soul. I didn't know a single person. And this was quite strange. So I thought, well, the next most obvious thing to do is to draw attention to myself. <laughs> So I went to the hairdresser that afternoon and I shaved all my hair off. And I thought, this is like a great tactic. I'll make friends, I'll meet people, they'll be like, where's your hair? You know, something like that. <laughs> you know? Um, and what I didn't realize is that they already noticed me the day before because I'd arrived at Varsity with no shoes on. And it didn't really occur to me. I can honestly tell you it didn't occur to me that it was unusual that I was A, riding a motorbike from Rhonda Bush. Uh, from Claremont through to Rondebosch every day on my motorbike in the winter with no shoes. It didn't occur to me that I was going through to varsity lectures with no shoes. But what did occur to me that was that if I shaved my hair off, I might potentially meet new people. <laughs> Funnily enough, when you don't have shoes on and you shave your hair off and it's 1994, you attract a little bit of a different crowd. <laughs> yeah. So I will tell you that some of the things that I learned around that time was that you know, being a certain way or looking a certain way will attract you certain things. But it's always sad to me how people make up their minds about you in the first 15 seconds that they meet you. I mean, I recognize that this is a fact, but sometimes you've got to take that little step further and dig a bit deeper. I think what for me really became quite frightening around that time was that I grew up and I started to realize there are a lot of assholes in the world. <laughs> it's quite strange. <laughs> but with that kind of knowledge, I also realized that, that the minute that I, tr I did something that someone said I couldn't do, I stopped listening to those limitations again. And that's a really important thing, is that sometimes you can listen in and tune in to the things that people tell you that you can do, and then tune out to the things that they tell you that you can't, because both things create impetus for change. I've always been a little bit of a paint-by-number person. Have any of you ever tried to paint by number? Is there any natural artists out there who can just pick up a brush and paint a beautiful picture? You can also buy things where they say, put this color in this dot. And then after, you've got this amazing picture, and you say, yes, I painted that myself. I paint by number. Kind of took me until I was 36 years old to realize that, and I'm 36 now, 36 <laughs> years old to realize that, you know what? It's really got absolutely nothing to do with what anyone else tells you that you can or can't do. And I think this is particularly important in the South African context, because... The biggest crime in South Africa is the killing of self-esteem. And what's really interesting to me about that is that there's no demographic for the perpetrators and there's no demographic for the victims. So when you take your head and you wrap around that and you think about the fact that your context is Grahamstown, your context is the TEDx talk. Some of us have had the sheer um, joy of being able to go to university and others haven't. Somewhere along the line, there's no demographic to say that someone's taking away your self-love. And we read a lot of theories and we hear a lot of things about how to be a better person in the world. And one of the things we have to overcome is that life is difficult. M. Scott Peck, who's one of my favorite authors, has a theory around saying that the minute we realize that life is difficult, life is not difficult anymore. Because we get used to the fact that there's ebbs and flows and the good comes with the bad. But we tend to have this global perspective. We think that if we think life is difficult and there's good and bad, we don't see that in ourselves, that we can be good and bad, and that there's always a balance. So there's three things that I'd like to share with you today. Out of all the stuff that I've learned, there's three principles that I live by. One is don't blame. It's a bit of a consciousness in this country. We tend to blame quite a lot. And you know, if you take one day and you just stop blaming anyone else or anything else for what's happening to you, you can start to take responsibility. And there's a difference between responsibility and being responsible. It's about saying, I own it. The second thing is, and I think this is the most beautiful gift that we can either teach our children or teach each other, is be kind. I especially like being kind when people least expect it. You can be in a queue somewhere at a shop and someone bashes you out the way tramps on your leg, and I go, oh, I'm so sorry, was I in your way? And it really undoes the person. 
I find that fantastic. The third thing I'd want to share with you is to have fun. Because if you can't have fun in life, what's the point? And the last thing that I want to say to you is that when we think about the places where we get our points of good and bad self-regulation, um, think back to things that your parents used to say when you were little, about the things that made you feel positive about who you are. I'm going to share a tiny story with you that made me laugh so much recently. A friend of mine, Sandy Lee, has a little boy. He's 21 months. And every time he gets something right, he likes to shout, Day! As in there. And so when they park, um, often to go to the shops, he will, you know, she'll pull into the parking and she'll go, and then he knows that they've parked and they're going to get out the car. The funniest thing happened to me the other day. We were in the car driving together to the shops and we pulled up into the parking uh, place and Sandy Lee suddenly shouted out, totally unconsciously, <laughs> So I start to wonder who the messages are for, you know? So I'm really going to encourage you to get out there and just be great South Africans. Just be really who you are. Merciful, don't blame. Be kind and really have fun. And thank you so much.